Welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. Uh, my name is Christoph Neidhardt. I'm a member of the Library Committee. And welcome to our online uh, audience too. And a very special uh, welcome to Ian Maloney, the author of uh, tonight's book, The Only Gaijin in the Village, A Year Living in Rural Japan. Uh, Ian is an inakamono but a special one because he's an Inakamono from Scotland turned into an Inakamono in Japan. And in the village he lives in Gifu, he's Maronkun. Yeah, Maronkun. <laughs> uh, where he lives with uh, his wife. Uh, and it's not only one year, it's already five or six years, I think. Yeah. And it's supposed to be more, become more. Ian is uh, uh, the author of three novels um, of uh, literary critic in the Japan Times. And uh, you came to Japan as an English teacher yeah. in, uh, I think, 2005. And you got uh, married uh, to Minori and decided to move to the countryside. Yes. And, uh, but uh, Ian is not only an English teacher and a book author, he is also a, la a language school owner, only I think just briefly here. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> no An amateur farmer harvesting car carrots that are too small. He's renovating his house, he's pruning the trees that he does with the uh, competent help of his father-in-law who is a handyman. They have a clear division of labor, he and his father-in-law. And when it comes to edible things and his father-in-law turns everything into something edible, a snake, for example, Ian writes, he kills, I cook. Okay. Um, except uh, there is no division of labor when you read the book, uh, you will learn that when it comes to drinking. The Japanese and Scots obviously are quite the same. Uh, <clears throat> actually, Ian, as I said, he has not spent one year in uh, rural Japan, so, but as the title suggests, so, but uh, already five or six. Uh, these uh, chapters in his book, uh, they started, he started it uh, as a column in, uh, the Gaijin pot, the website Gaijin pot. And he kept that tone we know from uh, like uh, old Sunday paper uh, columns, this uh, light photon uh, tone uh, where he reflects actually quite serious things, but uh, he kept a lightness uh, and, and connects a lot of things that you wouldn't think they belong to each other. He also reflects on very serious things such as immigration and to be a stranger. And of course, uh, that's unavoidable. Uh, he plays with the stereotypes uh, we gaijins have with the Japanese and the prejudices the Japanese have about us and all those misunderstandings, including those with language. Uh, it's quite difficult to keep the tone of a column for 240 pages, but uh, I would say Ian manages uh, very well. Uh, among others, by reminiscing about his childhood in Scotland, his, uh, um, about politics, a lot about culture. About his uh, childhood, he says somewhere, uh, as a 14 year old and still a bit shy, but once I pop, I can't stop. And I, we hope of course that will happen tonight. Uh, just one example uh, how uh, the, about the humor he has uh, about Japan's low birth rate. He writes, he says, or calls it a well publicized disinterest in the repro reproductive arts amongst young people. Uh, one last word, uh, our regular guests here, uh, they know that we often have a little difficulty to get. I 
I didn't mean that difficulty. <laughs> we have a little difficulty to get an audience uh, for our book break, breaks. Uh, this sometimes uh, worries us a bit because it looks like uh, the library committee has not done its homework. Today, however, I worry less because Ian is also a rock star, or as he says, a failed rock star. He and a colleague created a two-man band when he was already in Japan. The, what was it? The Welcome Camel. And they had their first concert with 12 people, but it was fun anyway. So let's, we have about 12 people here and some online. So let's hope it's fun anyway. So the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yep, excellent. All right, thank you, Christoph, for that excellent and um, <laughs> warming introduction. Um, I'm gonna read a few sections of the book and I'm gonna talk a little bit about it um, and yeah, give you a bit more information about it, hopefully encourage you to seek it out and buy it. And then, uh, yeah, I think we'll have some questions after that. Just one second, I'm afraid I have to interrupt you. Uh, I have forgot some housekeeping. You are supposed to keep the masks on. Uh, that's the club policy. And, uh, and of course, you should uh, uh, switch your cell phones to man mode. But uh, the masks, I'm, I have it here. I'm sorry I didn't. Please. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit strange this in Corona times, doing book breaks with screens and things. But uh, I feel like I've just signed for a football team or something. It's quite fun. Um, okay, let's start with a reading. I'm just going to read from um, page one of the book. This is uh, the first chapter. It's called, Yes, I am a long way from home. I'm going to die in Japan. At least that's the plan. Plan is the wrong word. I've not sat down like wily e. Coyote, gripped by a wave of self-destruction and plotted my own demise, strung an anvil from the roof or painted a tunnel on the garage door. Nor am I predicting that a North Korean missile will take me out anytime soon, though that is certainly more likely. I have the experience to prove it. It was the 29th of August, 2017. I was camping in Aomori, the most northerly prefecture on Honshu, Japan's main island. Over the water is Hokkaido, the last prefecture before Russia, then a string of disputed islands and ice. During the summer vacation, I'd thrown the camping gear in the back of the car, caught up in a surge of wild man envy. I needed masculine exploits and rugged scenery. By the time I'd reached Aomori, I'd already been stung 36 times by bees, de developed a fever as a result, been chased by a biker gang and run away from a hotel before they discovered that when my fever broke, I'd sweated so much I'd turn their comfortable mattress into a waterbed. I'd been traveling for 10 days, hadn't spoken to anyone for three, and was beginning to crack up. I woke about 4 a.m., packed up quickly, happy to have been undisturbed by bears, and pointed the car south. Mogwai soared from the open windows as I sped through glorious forest roads, the kind Ian Banks called Great Wee Roads, with the sun rising behind me. I joined the highway a little before six, my intention to go as far as Sendai, refuel and take it from there. A night in the city or another campsite? fresh sheets, or the pleasure of a lakeside sunset. My phone, acting as a sat-nav from the 100 yen holster I had taped to the dashboard, started buzzing like 36 bees had got inside it, immediately followed by a screeching alarm, far louder than the ear-hurting stereo volume. It was the J-Alert. Just realized I'm reading this to an audience in Japan for the first time. You all know what this is, but <laughs> excuse the explanation. J Alert is a nationwide warning system designed with two functions. The first is to give people a few seconds notice in advance of an earthquake or other disaster, since a few seconds is all science can give us, but it can make a lot of difference. It can be enough time to turn off the gas cooker, to get away from the windows, to get out of the shower and avoid the indignity of running from the house in soapy humiliation. 
The second purpose is to scare the living shit out of people. With a volume and tone similar to the howler letters in Harry Potter, think an air horn attached to a bullhorn being held down by someone intent on giving you a heart attack, the J alert has caused me to leap from bed in the small hours, stub a toe, crack a shin, hit my head and fall to the floor in terror. This time, it caused me to swerve wildly into the outside lane. Luckily, the highway was empty. The alarm finished. I righted my direction and pulled back into the inside lane. After the alarm, an electronic female voice announced in Japanese, missile launch, missile launch. What? Missile launch, missile launch. I thought that's what you said. I pulled the phone from its slot and tried to read the alert in Japanese in a tiny font, still doing about 100 kilometers per hour on the highway. Not bright, but, you know, special circumstances. Missile launch, missile launch. Get to a safe place, find somewhere underground, or go inside a strong building. I'm high in the air on a concrete strip. The next exit is 20 kilometers away. No further information from the J alert. I went on to Twitter. The alert was already trending, but every tweet was a variation of WTF. I phoned Minori, my wife. What? What's happening? I'm asleep. No, with the missile. What missile? The alert. Are you drunk? Put on the news and call me back. As I waited, I remembered that the day before, driving north, I'd been stuck behind a convoy of military vehicles, trucks, jeeps, and something that looked so suspiciously like a rocket launcher that I took a photo. For about 30 minutes, I'd trailed this convoy. I'd assumed there was a base nearby, though the surprised expressions and pointed fingers of villagers made me suspect not. They'd turned off a few kilometers before my junction, and I'd thought no more about it. Now the presence of that rocket launcher seemed ominous. Did they know something? Hi, where are you? I'm on a highway in Aomori. What's going on? The TV says it's a test. North Korea? Of course, it flew over Hokkaido and landed in the sea. She had this tone like it was the most mundane thing in the world, like she was reciting the weather forecast or responding to me telling her about my day. So we're not at war? No, not yet. What are your plans? I was going to go to Sendai. Now I'm not so sure. Okay, drive safe. Let me know if a war starts. Okay. As I drove south, I pondered my situation. If a war did break out, what would I do? In many ways, I was already in the best place. I was in the middle of nowhere, or at least very close to it, with enough provisions to last a week, maybe two if I was careful. I had a car full of camping gear, water, food, fresh and dried, but I was a long way from home. What would I do? Should I make a dash for home or hole up in the forest and wait it out? Scenes from various post-apocalyptic films played out. Soon I was imagining a zombie infestation and making plans. By 10 a.m. I'd reached Sendai. I came off the highway and refueled. I was exhausted, stiff, itchy and sore. And now Kim was lobbing missiles at me. The holiday was over. Time to go home. In 12 hours, I drove more than a thousand kilometers, stopping at service stations for lunch and dinner. When I swung into the driveway, I felt all my tension seep away. I was home. Cool. So that's how that's how the book opens. Um, as as Christoph said, this started initially as a as a column on Gaijin Pot. I've written and uh, well, I've published three novels and a collection of poetry before this book. So this is my fifth book. Um, and after those three novels, I sort of wanted to try something different. I wanted to try something new. My agent really wanted me to write about Japan because I've been living here since 2005. And I used to keep a blog and write about it. And I write in Japan Times about Japanese literature, things like that. So I was getting pressure to write about Japan, but I didn't really want to. There's a lot of um, foreigner in Japan memoirs out there, many, many books. And as a reviewer for Japan Times, I've read 
a lot of them. Some of them are great, some of them not so great. There's a lot of um, my first year in Japan, so 22, 23 year olds, usually young white men from Britain or America, come over, have a year in Japan, write a blog that turns into a book that's all just, oh my God, isn't it amazing? I can't read anything. I can't understand anything. Karaoke, sushi, and then they go home and that's the end of the book. And I really did not want to, to do that, to add another book to that pile. So I resisted for a while. But in 2017, I suppose it was, um, the then editor at Gaijinpot contacted me and a few other people looking for new ideas for columns. And I thought, I'm, I want to do something different. Maybe I can try and turn bits of my life into stories. I really wanted to write comedy more than anything. My novels are quite serious, dramatic things. I wanted to see whether or not I could write something funny. Um, so I thought about it for a while. And in 2016, we had moved from um, a kind of commuter town in Aichi, just north of Gifu, just north of Nagoya, sorry, out to rural Gifu. And I was having all these experiences, these kind of strange, interesting, fun, bizarre experiences that after 11 years, 12 years in Japan at that point, were kind of all new experiences, things that I hadn't done before, I hadn't experienced before, but also things that I hadn't really read about before. It wasn't the I'm a young, a young man in Tokyo experiences. It was I'm a middle-aged man in, in rural Japan. So I thought it was a, a good chance to try and do something a bit different with, uh, with a memoir about Japan. So I started those columns and they were just short, once a month, 800 words, trying to, as, as Christoph said, they were sort of very based on um, those Sunday newspaper columns that used to be really popular and have sort of disappeared to an extent because of uh, every, everyone does blogs now rather than columns. And it's a shame, it's a lost art, I think. Columns were a great part um, of certainly my Sunday when I was young. I used to love sitting down and reading the columns. The structure, the actual form of it is a, is a beautiful thing. Um, so I wanted to try that. Um, so I started um, doing that. And I think I'll read one of, the, one of the earliest ones I wrote to give an illustration of that. So one, one, of, the, um, one of the interesting things I experienced that was new um, after being in Japan for 11 years was the Chonaikai, the community, um, everyone working together. When I lived in, in the cities, you don't know your neighbors. You never really get to meet people. But in this village on the first day, the neighbors all came around and every couple of months we have meetings and there's all these tasks. And um, the first task for me was... Um, litter collection so the neighbors came around eight o'clock in the morning seven o'clock in the morning knocked on the door so this is that story my first collection um was litter collect my first experience was the litter collection split into teams the theory is that we cover a certain area picking up rubbish man-made or acts of god thereby bringing beauty and order to our pocket of japan in theory, as any economist, political leader, or parent will tell you, the gap between theory and practice is big enough to handbrake turn a double-decker bus through. Litter collection in our village is designated a man's job. Some jobs here are women's jobs, like cleaning the, cleaning the meeting hall, guarding the garbage sites, and cleaning them afterwards, and serving snacks and drinks at the meetings. Anything outdoors is a man's job. We prune trees, trim the verges with unnecessarily powerful but fun strimmers, massacre bamboo groves with home center approved serrated machetes, and walk the streets keeping it safe from stray tissues and cigarette butts. I haven't seen this demarcation specified in writing, but it is understood. It was therefore with much amusement that my wife waved me off at seven in the morning, barely raising her head from the pillow to laugh. Our team consists of me, 
Asai-san, Goto-san, a divorced man in his 50s who lives alone, and Ishikawa, who has three happy, highly energetic, noisy young daughters and leaves for work early, returning late. I'm meeting Goto for the first time. Ishikawa grunts an ohio before releasing a smoker's cough that sounds like an IED going off under a tank. Goto gives me a nod and the last two syllables of an onagaishimas. It's Sunday morning. We all work hard. None of us want to be doing this. And by the look of things, I'm not the only one who indulged in a little light refreshment the night before. Prepped in advance by Asai, I have a pair of gloves and a plastic bag. Goto has a bag sticking out of his pocket and no gloves. Asai has a pair of gloves tucked under his belt and no bag. Ishikawa has a can of coffee and a packet of mild seven cigarettes. We set off down the street. The thing is, our area is spotless. The only people who ever come here are residents, family, or those on business, delivering, fixing, or selling things. There's no through road, no one litters. Anything the wind brings in from outside is immediately picked up. There are no businesses that might inadvertently cause trash. There are literally no businesses. A local ordinance stipulates that the land can be used for residential or farmland, nothing commercial. So this is a waste of time. We walk about 50 meters down the road. I find a pet bottle cap that seems to have been embedded in the ground since the Paleocene and prize it out. We continue. Asai fills the silence by pointing out which vegetables are growing in each patch. Each patch is the same as the one before. We pass another team with similarly sullen Ohio's. Are they in our area or are we in theirs? They have empty bags as well. Asai leads us through a shortcut by the meeting hall and loops us back home. Ishikawa drops his cigarette end in his can, drops the can in the bag. We reach home. Asai goes inside and comes out with four cans of coffee. We sit on his wall drinking them, him talking about the weather and the trees, us three silent but for slurps and sighs. Goto gives another ass and disappears inside. It's 7.17 a.m. Is that it? I ask Asai. We were seen, he says. That's enough. So that's, that's the first thing I discovered. Um, moving out to the countryside, there are all these duties, all these responsibilities, and everybody hates them. Nobody really wants to do them. They just have to. Um, and everything is about being seen to do it. So for me, the only foreigner, the only non-Japanese person in, uh, in this village, it was a great lesson, a useful lesson. Be seen to fit in, be seen to make an effort to try and fit in. Um, but there's always some weird things that come up um, every once in a while. Um, the, the most difficult thing for me, moving out into really, really rural areas, has been the language. Um, I learned Japanese, um, living in the cities, talking to people my own age. So if we're going to chat about, how, about football, how Nagoya Grampus are doing just now, great, I can do that in Japanese. My neighbours are generally 85 years old and over. They're all, almost all, very old. Young people have moved away. It's one of those villages that's really, um, really, really needs young families to move in. Um, so we tend not to talk about Nagoya Grampus and things like that. Um, and the old men in particular talk in very fast, very casual, very mumbled Japanese, which is really, really difficult for me. Um, but it's been great. If, if you ever want a really good Japanese lesson, sit and drink a can of coffee with an 85-year-old man. Best listening practice you can ever get. Um, so, yeah, I've had experiences with that. I wrote a few sections about um, those kind of problems where I make mistakes because of, the, because of my bad Japanese, as it is at that point. Um, and yeah, let's read one of those now. This isn't with a neighbor. This is uh, me making a mistake with my father-in-law, which is a bit more serious, I think. Um, yeah. 
I had a horrifying language moment with my father-in-law, Yoji, just before Minori and I got married. Um, in winter, sorry, in winter, Japanese people like to eat oden. It is a kind of hot pot dish with things like boiled rice, daikon, and fish cakes served in a soy broth. It is warming on a cold day, sold at most convenience stores. One of the ingredients is konyaku, a jelly-like thing that resembles the kind of congealed gloop you find behind an old fridge. Everyone else loves it. I can't stand it. Really don't like it. A few months before we got married, we were around at her parents' house. Miyoko had prepared oden, and I was passing bits of konyaku to Minori. The conversation was flowing around me, as it often does. Like all families, they were talking of people they all know, shared memories, things that I couldn't understand, even if I knew every word and grammatical form they were using, something I didn't at the time. People often forget that uh, understanding the language is only half the battle. I can understand every word you say, but if you're talking about something I've never heard of or have no experience of, I'm not going to be able to join in the conversation. My grandmother was endlessly telling me stories about people who had died long before I was born, expecting me to know who they were. Imagine that combined with a whole other language and culture. I just tuned out. Anyway, I wasn't paying much attention to the chat, just focusing on getting all of this rubbery crap out of my bowl when Yoji says, how do you feel about konyaku? I look up. Sorry, but I really don't like it. It's that feeling, it makes me feel, and I shudder, unable to find the word for that feeling. He looks shocked, a little angry, something I've never seen before in this placid man. Everyone else is laughing. I turn to Minori, what? She answers in Japanese. He asked how you feel about konyaku. Yeah. But this time I notice something is wrong with the grammar. They're using konyaku as a verb and have turned it into the present tense. I am konyakuing. What does that mean? Konyaku, I say, with lifting some with my chopsticks. I don't like it. Renewed laughter, this time from y Yoji as well. No, says Minori in English this time. Not konyaku, konyaku. There's a small two after the n. Can you hear the difference? No. What does it mean? To be engaged. He asked how you feel about marrying me. So I will never forget that verb. <laughs> that is embedded in my head. Um, are we okay for time? Good. Um, cool. I'll read one more little bit. The last um, one of the, the most difficult things I had to experience moving from the city out into the countryside is all the things that try to kill you in the Japanese countryside. There are bears, there are inoshishi, wild boar, there are these centipedes that just give me the creeps. They keep coming into the house. So you find a centipede that big in your bed, you never sleep well again. It's awful. Um, and snakes. We have snakes in my garden. Um, I'm from Scotland. Scotland does not have snakes, um, or certainly not dangerous ones. These are things I was not in any way prepared for. Um, so let's read a bit about that. Um, moving into the countryside and becoming an amateur farmer introduced me to a new and unfamiliar concept. I found myself thinking, I know just how Samuel L. Jackson feels snakes, not on a plane, but hiding in the woodpile between rocks and once in the well. Japan is not safe. Scotland is safe. Seismically, Scotland is as active as a teenager at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning. Despite a dirty great fault line running through the country like a samurai's death slash, its geology snoozes deeper than if it had a chemistry test at nine o'clock and it'd been up until three. There are no bears, no wild boars, and the only venomous snake is the adder, so unthreatening it was named after a condescending term for a mathematician. Japan, and my garden in particular, has the mamushi, the brown and beige pit viper with a diamond-shaped head. There are other, more dangerous snakes, such as the habu, but chubu is too cold for them. They 
like the US Armed Forces, prefer the warmth of Okinawa. For this, I give thanks. I would far rather be St. Patrick patron sainting over land free of snakes than Samuel L. Jackson battling them. But like Jackson, peacefully enjoying his in-flight movie and complimentary nuts, battle sought me out. Where my land ends and Asai's begins, there are a number of what can only be described as massive boulders. They were placed there by the previous owner's grandfather during a spell of Zen decorating or Feng Shui rearranging, and very nice they are too. Japanese gardening uses the theory of borrowed landscape, where the garden design incorporates aspects beyond the boundaries to create depth. In this instance, the boulders form a symbiotic relationship with Mount Ontake in the distance. They also harbour Mamushi. I am a peaceful man. When I first noticed the coil of muscle and the diamond head, I made a deal with it, much as I had with my students. Let's just leave each other alone. However, the Mamushi is dangerous, particularly to children, and the Asai family have three of them, three children, not snakes. So I decided something had to be done. I tried to capture it with the aim of relocating it far from harm, but the snake didn't seem keen on that. It had found a nice spot to rest and considered me something of an unwelcome bailiff. And so it was that, much like a Trump press conference, things quickly took a turn for the worse battle commenced. Nothing in my Scottish upbringing had prepared me for this moment. The closest I'd come to confronting nature head on had been frantically sweeping a mouse out of the kitchen of an Edinburgh flat like a crazed Olympic curler. The closest I'd come to snake bite was in the student union. I donned, I donned my armor, Wellington boots and oven gloves, and selected a weapon. In the junkin of life, it turns out, shovel beats snake. I felt horrible, but I'd have felt worse if one of the children had died of a snake bite. In the bonfire, I gave it a funeral fit for a Viking chief, then texted my wife. I just killed a mamushi. What did you do with it? I cremated it. My dad's going to be angry. What? Had I committed some enormous faux pas? Was there some Shinto cleansing ritual that needed to be performed? Some Buddhist rite that would make amends for the murder I had committed? My father-in-law never struck me as a particularly religious or spiritual man, but maybe I had underestimated him. Wrecked with guilt and more than a little put out that my bravery in selflessly putting myself between harm and the Asai children had gone unremarked, I stoked the fire, being far more careful when grabbing wood off the pile than I had been, and waited to get told off. Sure enough, the text was not long in coming. You killed a mamushi. Do you still have the body? No, I burned it. Next time, call me. Why? What you do is, you skin it, then you cook it over the fire. It is delicious, particularly the tail. It goes so well with sake. So that is my uh, father-in-law's attitude <laughs> to snakes. You see a snake, catch it, eat it. That's the best thing to be done. Um, I have not done that and will not do that <laughs> as much as I could possibly manage. Um, I think that's okay. a good Thank place to stop. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much, Ian. Then we come to the to a Q and A. Or and as I always say, this is not a press conference. You don't have to ask a question. You can always also express an opinion but no speeches, please. And uh, <laughs> when you uh, ask your question, you're supposed to come to go to that microphone and uh, please introduce yourself. The, the uh, guests online on Zoom are welcome to ask questions too. For that, you have, I think you have to raise your electronic hand <laughs> and then I will be notified. Uh, who has a question first? Otherwise, I'm going going first. I remember uh, you were strictly against being 
assigned to the firefighters. Yes. <laughs> but eventually your wife assigned you to the firefighters without you knowing, isn't it? Kind of, yes. Yeah. So our area is one, we don't really have a volunteer force. There's, a, there's kind of a proper regular firefighters force. But um, when, you're, when it's your turn to be hancho of the area, you also kind of have to sign up for all of these other tasks. Now, most of the families, there's someone in the house that's kind of there all the time. It's either um, the mother is there as a housewife all the time, or the, the grandfather is retired. He's there all the time. And the community, the Chonakai, is, is still based around that idea that there's always somebody at home and there's always somebody um, who's free. And that's not the case. There's just me and my wife um, in the house and we both work full time. She's a nurse, so she frequently works night shifts, things like that. Um, so when it came our turn to, but well, officially my turn to be Hancho, because it's a man's job, um, we sort of divided the, the job because my Japanese is not good enough to host meetings with the village and discuss problems and deal with financial things, but she doesn't have the time to do it all. Um, so yeah, we, we split the tasks and I did what I could, she did what she could. Um, and I did things when she was working, which included hosting a meeting where we discussed the finances, which is still the most difficult thing I've ever done in Japanese. I have no idea what we agreed um, in that meeting. We could have spent the money on a bouncy castle. I have no idea. Um, but one of the things you're supposed to sign up for is um, to be a part-time firefighter, if such a thing is needed, to be the representative of the Chonakai. And um, my wife just wrote my name down on the form. Didn't tell me or anything like that um, until some, somebody pointed out that I had missed a meeting um, that I was supposed to be in. I was like, I didn't sign up for this. I, I don't, my father was a firefighter his entire career. And I, I know exactly what that job involves. I do not have the courage to do that. Um, fortunately for everyone concerned in that year, there, there were no fires. <laughs> so I was never called on and I think I'm off the books now, but um, yeah, I dodged the bullet there. I was talking to someone who had a similar experience, um, except it was when they were an ALT in a school, they were signed up by their school and it was proper like you have to go every week and train you have to do that and they had no idea about it so yeah so you're not a firefighter anymore even officially not i guess my name's on a piece of paper okay. somewhere but like i get my left and right confused sometimes in japanese like when i'm driving and my wife says migi and i turn that way <laughs> if we're fighting a fire in a building and i've got a hose and they're giving me directions and I'm going the wrong way, someone's going to die, probably me. So it is not a good idea for, for me to be a firefighter in any sense. Um, I'm happy to help out, but that's just too dangerous. Yeah. Anybody? Yes, please. Thank you very much for your speech and a book. I really enjoyed it. Ah, um, my name is Yusuke Wada. I'm an associate member. I'm an um, ex-mortician okay. and a free funeral director. And um, it's just, not, it's not a question. So it's, uh, it's an opinion. Um, next time you cremate a mamushi, please keep the bones. It's a ritual to okotsuage, okay. to pick up the bones and place it in the urn. Okay, for, <laughs> for, for snakes as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That could be interesting in the garden, have a, se a series of urns from, from all the snakes that come in. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I don't know how strong snake bones are, whether they do. <laughs> they'll survive a fire. But yeah. Cool. <laughs> Good opinion. Yes, Siegfried, please. Siegfried Knittel, Freelancer from Germany. Um, uh, two, two things uh, about Konjaku. Uh, 
uh, the problem for, for me is uh, every time um, there are a lot of uh, words like this. Every time I have uh, sometimes a conflict with uh, Bjorn and Bjorn. Uh. <laughs> uh, I, every time I change it, and uh, so, uh, I, everyone is laughing when I make the mistake <laughs> about about it. Uh, yeah, and uh, the other point is uh, you with the uh, with the snake, with the snake. Yeah, you said um, not with the konjaku. You you don't like you don't like to eat konjaku. Yeah. Do you say do you don't I don't like it? No. I don't. I'm I'm not that strong about it. No, I say. Uh... Because I have every time the conflict with my wife, she said, you, you should not talk directly. You you don't like it. You have to prescribe it, uh, kind of find a way to uh, <laughs> to express it in a different <laughs> way. It's every time a conflict between, between my wife and me. Mm. So I think uh, you, do you have a, a similar conflict about this? Um, I think my wife has given up. I thought given up. Oh. <laughs> she just nods her head. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, I think if you're going to be indirect, I would take the, the Marie Kondo approach mm -hmm. and say, this konyaku does not bring me joy. Uh -huh. And maybe do uh -huh. it that way. That's nicely indirect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or you just say, Chotto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amari. Yeah. Do it that Anybody way. else? Yeah. It's interesting about the the uh, Bioin and Bioin. Yeah. The one I've been doing that recently, I was saying to Christopher earlier, I'm, I'm doing my PhD at the moment. I think Japanese for PhD is Hakushigo. And um, I keep missing out one of the syllables and saying Hashigo, which means ladder. I, I am studying for my ladder. Um, it's just get people at work staring at me like, what? Why? And when you say that, you remind me that I <clears throat> uh, forgot to mention that you're also a university teacher now <laughs> uh, among yeah. your jobs. Uh, anybody? Otherwise, uh, I'm going to ask you some more, more theoretical. There is a French uh, uh, Japanologist, or was, I think he's not alive anymore, who wrote a book about the difference between the Japan, Japanese sense of space and the Western sense of space. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to discuss space now, but he says that the difference between uh, big city Japan and rural Japan is much smaller than between big city Europe and rural Europe. And he explains that by exactly these community services and these neighborhood, I mean, we have the Kailum Barn every week. Mm. And uh, so uh, you you are probably one of the few here, or maybe the only one who can compare that. Um, compare big city Japan. The different, I mean, it was it the biggest step uh, to go from countryside Scotland to Aberdeen uh, or from uh, Nagoya to, to GIF? don't know that is a really difficult question because well for many reasons but because of the age yeah. difference so i moved from rural scotland into the city when i was 18 and yeah. starting university so it was amazing there were shops and cinemas and pubs that i could go into and um it was fantastic whereas i moved out into the japanese countryside when i was what, 36 37 um after so when i moved into the city i then lived in cities all the time and yeah we were kind of both sick of urban and suburban life my wife grew up in the countryside as well um in gifu um so we were both yearning for peace quiet not being so close to our neighbors I, i'm in a band i play guitar and i like turning it up and making noise i'd like to be far enough away from my neighbors that they don't complain and obviously in an apartment you can't do that um in terms of shift i really don't know because you've also got to factor into like my experience moving from scotland to japan and that's obviously a much much bigger shift generally so I don't know which is bigger moving from 
moving to the Japanese countryside is more interesting, <laughs> I think, because the experiences I've had have all been, yeah, pretty much have all been positive. They've all been great. You know, moving into a city, um, you get an increase in pollution, you get an increase in crime, you get an increase just in, in stress generally, certainly I do. Um, moving into the countryside, I relaxed more, but also my neighbors were really nice. They were really welcoming. Um, as I say, I, I am the only foreigner that lives there, but they, there was nobody that was like, oh my God, there's a foreigner here. We don't want that. Everybody was curious and interested and welcoming. Um, and, you know, I made friends with the neighbors quite quickly or as friendly as, as we can be. Um, so yeah, it was probably bigger, but in a positive way. Mm. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, to move from the anonymity of a big uh, mm. Western city to the anonymity of, of Tokyo might not be such a big difference after all. Probably not. No, mm. it's, a, it's the differences that would be smaller. But yeah, I suppose I'd, I don't know. When I first moved to Nagoya in 2005, it felt kind of like a village in a sense. There wasn't that many... You, you wouldn't see that many foreigners walking around the streets of Nagoya at the time. Not then. Now, now there's a lot more. So it felt um, sort of more rural in a sense then than it does now. But yeah, there's less anonymity. But or there was initially. One of the interesting things is there was that initial sort of three-month period where I was a curiosity. Um, and the neighbors would come around and people would stop stop me and try to speak to me and after about three months they got bored of me I was like yeah we know who he is he's not causing problems he's not playing music too loud he's not inviting 30 people around for a barbecue and staying until midnight you know I'm well behaved um I've been in Japan long enough I understand kind of what's expected so you know I try to be a good neighbor and after a while I'm just like yeah yeah he's just there now so you pass the tests, so to say. I guess. I mean, they yeah. might be saying nasty things mm. about me behind my back, but certainly but they <laughs> as say, far as I they know. They're... They said they're always nasty things about other people's back. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's just humans. <laughs> we all do that. Uh, and your barbecues, of course, are famous in the village, aren't they? My barbecues, my fires. I've got a fire pit um, that, that I built up and is, yeah, is, is a bit mad. I've got all these little statues and broken things around um but i love um barbecuing and having fires in the middle of winter when it's when the snow on the ground having a fire is just the most amazing thing um and my neighbors think i'm insane and we come out wrapped up scarves and hats I said, and um yeah but after a while there was there was one one um fire just after new year in the first year where um i was just sitting happily having a fire having a beer and one by one, a couple of my neighbors came and joined me. And um, yeah, it was really nice. Giving them a little bit of my mad Scottish, we don't mind the cold culture. Um, yeah, my dad invented what I call the, uh, I call it in the book, a sarcastic barbecue, which is I've got family in Australia and they came over to Scotland for Christmas one year. And um, all they would speak about, they're young, like 12, 13 year old kids. And all they would speak about is, in Australia, we have Christmas Day on the beach. We have a barbecue for Christmas Day. This is too cold. So on uh, the 26th, my dad, exasperated with this, went, right, fine, let's have a barbecue. And snow, like minus five degrees, something like that, lit the barbecue and started cooking food. And the Australians were inside. No, I'm not going outside. Um, so yeah, we coined that the, uh, the sarcastic barbecue. Which is, is a fun thing to have. <laughs> Anybody? Yes, Siegfried, please. Do you have an izakaya in, in the village? <laughs> no. Oh, how I wish. <laughs> you know, this is for me uh, very important. When I, in the, in the 80s and uh, 70s, 80s, I often went to England, Scotland, and Ireland. And I like to do stay at night in a pub to have a pint, talk with people, and uh, yeah. 
And mm. when I came to, to uh, Japan, I learned about the isakayas. And I thought, oh, it's like it's like England, like like a, a island. Uh, so I so I liked it, and it had, and I think it's one reason I I get close to uh, Japan yeah. to go to, uh, at night to uh, isakaya. And, yeah, I do it often with my with my wife. Nobody can we cannot do it so much, but normally uh, uh, before Corona and after, I hope to uh, will happen again. <coughs> We every week, every week go four or five times at night to Isakaya. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great for me. <clears throat> it is, yeah. I, I, I do miss that. When I first moved to Japan, I lived across the road from an Isakaya, and that's where I first started learning Japanese, just go across and chat to whoever. Um, but yeah, we have a post office is literally the only business in the area. Um, there is there is a train station. It's about a twenty minute walk to the train station, and then we can we can get a train and go out. But we usually don't. It's uh, if we go out for dinner, we go out early, drive, and then come back and drink at home. Um, and it's it's actually quite good if you're trying to keep the drinking levels down because if you run out of beer. There's no convenience store. There's no vending machines. You can't go out and get more, and you can't drive because you've you've already had whatever you had. So, from that point of view, it's quite good. Like, All right, evening's over now. Whereas you know, if you're in the city, it's like ah, Seven Eleven. Let's continue the party. Um, but yeah, I kind of miss just being able to walk down and, and have a beer. So, yeah. Yes, please. Mitsuya Goto, I've been coming to this club since 1969. I'm already 92 years old, but you gave me your business card that said you are a professor of cross-cultural communication at the Sugiyama Jogakin University yes. for women in Nagoya. That's my hometown. Wow. Now, <laughs> question I want to ask, do you commute to this university in Nagoya from this small village in Gifu Prefecture? Yes, I do. I do. I drive to work. It's about a 90-minute drive. Um, well, when there's traffic, when uh, I go. I try to go into work about five o'clock in the morning when there's no traffic, <laughs> and it's a lot faster. Yeah, it's it's a long commute, but um, one of the problems of living in, in rural Japan is there are not many jobs for English speakers out there. So I have to do that. But we, it's one of the things we spent three years looking for our land and looking. We looked all over Japan um, to find sort of the perfect place to live. Um, and one of the things we discussed is what is more important, having sort of perfect place to live, even if it's really far from work, really inconvenient. My wife's a nurse, so she can, as long as there's a hospital nearby, she will always find work. Um, so she works about 20 minutes away. That's, that's no problem. And I decided for me, I would rather live somewhere re really rural and drive a long time than live close to work but not have a garden not have um, some big land it's a balance that that i'm happy with because on friday i finish work at five o'clock i sit in the traffic for 90 minutes but when i get home i'm in the countryside and i'm there until monday i can relax it's it's like going away for the weekend um, and it's I like that trade. I like that balance. So it's a, it's a long drive, but um, that's why podcasts are very, very useful. So, yeah. And you commute five days a week? Um, at the moment, I do. Yeah. Um, hopefully that's going to go down to four. Um, it's, a, it, it's a new job. I just started at the start of April. So just now I'm in every day learning everything. 
hopefully that will calm down you know and, yeah i was going to say and i can teach from home but i've done too much teaching from home <laughs> in the last year um it's really nice to commute again after 12 months of commuting by walking to my spare bedroom and opening the computer so yay we have an online question by Mr. Gibson. Gibson. Hi, I'm zooming in here. Uh, Daryl Gibson is my name. And I was wondering, your town, you say, only has a post office now. Did it at one point have all of the services and so on? And did they go away or... Um, I, how did it get so um, friendly, perhaps? Um, that's a good question. There, as far as I can tell, there's no evidence of shops and things that used to be there. The only thing there is, and, and this is perhaps um, stereotypical in a sense, is that there's an old abandoned pachinko um, <laughs> shop that looks like it's been abandoned for about... 20, 30 years is very abandoned. But um, I think it's more that the area used to be mostly farmland, uh, mostly rice fields. A lot of it still is. Um, and slowly the farmland has been put over for residential, but um, not for businesses. They're very, very strict about um, what you can build and why. Um, yeah. I can't, I don't think there would have been, any, there used to be, the problem is there used to be um, a bus that came through and connected the village much better with the, with the nearest town, but they stopped that a few years ago. And it's, it's pretty bad because as I say, a lot of the, the residents are old and retired and not very mobile. Um, a lot of them can't drive because of their eyesight and things. And they're kind of stranded. Um, you know, they have to either get online delivery, which, you know, not all of them are particularly happy using the internet for shopping or get friends and family to drive them places. So, yeah, it's a shame. Maybe you tell us a bit more about how you searched for that house and how you found it, how the purchasing process happened. Because I remember when we first came to Japan and we uh, wanted to rent a, a really old uh, wooden Japanese house, the Fudosan immediately had an alternative that was new. Mm. Yeah, we had, we had a lot of fun because we started looking. And as you say, um, in Japan, usually the market is for new houses, new build houses, you know, young people get married, have the first kid, buy a new house. And that's, for me anyway, coming from, from Britain, it's, it's a strange idea that you buy one house, you buy your first house, and that's where you're going to live. That's where you're going to die. Probably you don't sell it on. So it took us a long time to decide, first of all, to that we were going to buy a house because it is a big commitment. You lose money as soon as you buy it. It's like buying a car. It devalues immediately. Um, so we spent a long time thinking. And then when we decided, right, we're definitely going to do it, we drew up a list of things that were important to us and things that were less important. So big land, very important. Convenience, much less important. Um, drew up a list, had a look online, but there's not much and certainly as you say old houses there's you know around us there's a lot of old houses lying empty and no one's trying to sell them because they think there's not really a market for it it's, it's a real shame but so we drew up our list and went to uh fudo-san um an estate agent that um someone my wife knows <coughs> excuse me someone my wife knows recommended we went to him and he said right you want to buy a house Great. I'm like, yep. Yeah. Uh, we've got a list. He's like, okay, first thing on the list, you want to be near a train station. Yes. I'm like, no, we, we don't care. He's like, oh, but everyone wants to be near a train station. I'm like, no, no, we, we don't mind. We've, we've got cars. That's fine. He's like, okay. But you want to be near your work. Yeah. Where do you work? I'm like, no, no, no. We're both going to quit our jobs and move wherever. You know, we're going to get new jobs and I'll just commute. Oh, okay. That's, that's a bit strange. And we, 
everything we told him we wanted was kind of the opposite of what he expected and what he'd been used to. You know, he sort of had a set pattern. This is what you do. And after about 20 minutes of discussing it, he sort of sat back and went, I, I don't know. I don't know how to help you. I, I can't think of any properties I know that, that fit what you want. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, you know, thanks for helping us. And he went, but I love a challenge. My job's got really boring. This sounds fun. I'll take you on. And he went off. And as I say, there was about three years we were looking for stuff. And he just went sort of driving all over Gifu and phoning people and went to Miekan and, and Shogokan, places like this, trying to find all of these places. And then he'd take us out. We went to look at a place up in Takayama. We went to look at a place down near Ise, um, all these different places. And he was having a great time. <laughs> it's like, you know, finding new build houses for young couples, that's easy. <laughs> you can just do that in a day, but this was fun. And then the irony to Capital is the, the place we bought was not a place he found. It was a friend of mine found it online and went, oh, Ian, you should check this place out near me. And we drove past and, and looked at it. So yeah, it was, it was an interesting process, but very unusual one. How many objects did you look at? Um, we, we physically visited about five uh -huh. um, and online looked at a lot more. Um, but it was interesting because he'd find places and show them to us, even though he thought they were bad. Like there was one place he showed us and it was a beautiful old house, like really beautiful, um, old bungalow style, but like many, many rooms, inner courtyards, big koi ponds, all that, like just perfect in every way. And he showed us the pictures. I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. We want to go see it. And he went, no, 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 you can't buy this one. I'm like, well, why not? And he showed another photo, which was the next door house, which had one of those massive Uyoku sound trucks, the big black trucks parked next door. And he's like, you cannot live next to them. You cannot buy this house. It will be bad. I'm like, okay. So why did you show us this beautiful house just to take it away? It was just to show he was doing his job. Oh. But yeah, that would have been interesting, I think. <laughs> Anybody? Otherwise, I continue. You mentioned the Apia in your village, the right. empty houses. Yeah. Uh, how do the villagers think about those? I mean, they, they fall apart and some of them are actually dangerous. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's enough, there's enough space between all the houses that kind of, I don't think any of them are actually going to fall on people. Although I guess well, you'd be, fire. Yeah, fire. I guess you'd be worried about kids maybe playing in them. I think everyone just thinks it's a shame. Like everyone's sad. Their, their kids grew up there and then moved away. They moved to Tokyo or Nagoya or Osaka for work, started their families. So in Golden Week in Obon, everyone comes back there's cars with nagoya plates and tokyo plates and things and there's kids running around for a few days and then they all leave again and this land's going empty because the grandparents die and their children who now have lives in in the cities they're not coming back um so there's there's one really near us and about once starting from yesterday about once not yesterday last weekend sorry um, about once a month, the guy will come up from Nagoya, cut all the grass, trim back the bushes, and then go away again. And it just sits empty the whole year. And it's, it's beautiful. It's got an old kura and, and everything. But I think, yeah, how do they feel? They feel sad. Everyone just feels sad. You know, they, they grew up there. Their children grew up there. Their grandchildren come and play there. But it's dying, in a sense. Um, hopefully. Some of those families will come back or others will come in, but yeah. It's not likely. Not likely. I mean, some might. One of my neighbors just um, sort of redid his whole garden and built new walls and built a garage. And reading between the lines, it seems to be with the intention of sort of enticing his son to come back with his family. You know, you come and live here. Look, it's, it's beautiful. It's big. There's more space. But yeah. I'm going to ask more about the <clears throat> process of buying the house. I mean, uh, 
Did, does the Japanese bank give you a mortgage for an old house nobody thinks is worth anything? Um, that and did you pay the price anyway? I mean, yeah, <laughs> that was weird. Getting a mortgage was weird because I'm not Japanese, my wife is. But at the time we were buying the house, my wife was changing jobs because we were moving out into the countryside. So she'd left her old hospital and was taking like two months of break before starting a new job so we could, we could sort all this stuff out. But that meant that technically she was unemployed. So I was a foreigner, still am. She was unemployed. Two things the banks don't like when they're lending money. So we went into the bank and had a long talk with them and they came up with this ingenious solution that they took her as Japanese and me as employed and made one person. <laughs> and that one person could borrow money. Luckily, the bank manager's friends with the Fudo-san. That's a good Fudo-san if they've got a friend like that. Um, but yeah, they sort of, yeah, pretended we were one person, one Japanese person with a job. And and that one other. person is the legal owner of the house. Um, yeah, we, I, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> had to go there. I had to, because of that, it meant I had to fill in all of the mortgage forms. Again, no idea what I signed. I <laughs> could not read all of that kanji, but the, the bank manager was going, he would write down a kanji and say, copy that in there. Okay, <laughs> do that stamp and done so yeah it was it was a weird thing um but buying big things in japan can be weird um so there's a story in there about when i bought my car with the cash with, yeah there's so I, I bought a new car and i had money saved for it um and all i had to do was transfer the money from my bank account to the car dealer and i went into it was the it was a post office bank account because all we have is a post office we don't have a bank nearby i went into the post office i would like to do an electronic transfer to this place i'm sorry you can't do that we do not do electronic transfers it was like 1.8 million yen something like that we we can't do that okay well what should i do i need to pay for my car and they went oh we can give you the cash what you can't do an electronic transfer, but you can give me 1,800,000 yen in cash in one go. Yes, please wait. <laughs> so got the form, stamped it, and got one of those bank envelopes and <laughs> ramming Ichimane notes into it. There you go. And I went back, and my wife was waiting in the car. I went back outside kind of shocked, sort of hiding <laughs> this envelope of money. And my wife's like, what's wrong? I was like... <laughs> got cash and the post office the, the woman in the post office said just take that to a bank and they'll do the transfer so we started driving aiming to go to the bank and i said to my wife kind of as a joke wouldn't it be funny if we just went to the dealer with the cash and paid for it and my wife laughed and went, okay let's do that and i have never felt so much like a gangster in my life walking into the Suzuki dealership and going, there you go, <laughs> 1.8 million yen. And then watching her go, one, two, three, four, five, and giving me change. It was mad, but fun. <laughs> I remember when we bought the car, we had to pay part cash, part credit card. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, are you a successful uh, vegetable farmer now? In the beginning, the, the onions <laughs> remained so yeah. small. The, with the carrots, you allow yourself the pun with four men size matters. <laughs> yeah. So are the carrots bigger now? Um, yeah. My, uh, my career as a vegetable grower is, is very hit or miss. Um, some things work, some things don't work. Why they do that, I have absolutely no idea. I'm very good with tomatoes. I get loads of tomatoes. That's fine. Um, coriander, cilantro, takes over the garden. That is amazing. Um, onions, I have no luck with whatsoever. Um, I, one year, I got some good onions. The rest of the time, they're, I claim they're shallots. That was my plan. <laughs> they're that big. Um, that, yeah. Um, 
potatoes I can do. I sort of, I've, I've been busy recently. So I tried really hard the first couple of years and then I sort of scaled it back. But um, my neighbors, there's, there's two old guys live either side of me that grow just insane amounts of vegetables. They eat way more than their family could ever eat and they give them out. And they're just, it's all they do with their time is just grow vegetables and they're obsessed with it. And they keep complaining that my garden is, my garden's like got lots of trees, cherry blossom trees and momiji, and it's really beautiful, nice place to hang out. But there's a lot of what they think is wasted space because you could cut down all these trees, turn it all into farmland and grow more vegetables. And I refuse to. But they come over and they're like, you're doing that wrong. You're doing that wrong. You need more compost. You need more fertilizer. That should be in that way. You don't get sun in that corner. And just give me all, all this. It's useful advice, but done in a very, very patronizing way, <laughs> um, which is fair enough. Um, but yeah, I've, I've kind of got to my limitations, I guess, at the moment. And um, I don't need to grow all that much because they will always grow too much and bring some over and go, hey, yeah, you all need to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, I grow th things like potatoes that you can store and use for six months. That's great. But things like lettuce, it's too much trouble. Anybody? Otherwise, I continue. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was that story about the, was that sweet peas or snow peas that you never get to cook? Oh, yeah, I tried growing peas. It was more, yeah, when I was a kid, my grandfather yeah. would grow peas in the garden, big trellises of peas. And me and my sister and the other grandchildren would steal all of them and eat them. So every, every year he'd go out to harvest his peas and there would be none. There'd be none on there. Um, so I started growing them mainly out of nostalgia for that. There's something, yeah, for me, the smell of peas in their pod growing is, is do great. they work um i got some it's the season now it? <laughs> it is now yeah the, the plants growing up um yeah I get, I get some probably if you actually took them inside and cooked them maybe enough for for a meal for two people but oh. <laughs> they never make it inside because they just <laughs> pop and eat them like that Anybody a question? Otherwise, we might close soon. Yeah, I think then, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. It was a great pleasure. Yeah. Thank you all for coming out very much. It's and uh, very pleased to see you in these trying times, public events. So I have rare, a couple so of announcements. The next book break is uh, on May 12th, uh, by our Robert Whiting, Tokyo Chunky, 60 Years of Bright Lights and Back Alleys and Baseball. Again at 5.30, like tonight. And for as a token uh, for uh, of gratitude that you came, you will be a one year honorary member of the FCCJ. Excellent. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Did I forget? Ah, I forgot one thing. The book is available at the reception for 2,000 yen. Thank you very much.